Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Trofin at the Babbling Belgian and welcome back to Gwent Edge, the show where we talk about everything that is new in Gwent. Because we just got hit with another patch, patch 8.2, and the amazing new journey that has been added, Jennifer's journey. We finally got the one and only true love of Geralt in uh, Gwent in the journey system. So she's got an all new journey of her own. And today we're going to be talking about both the journey and the changes that have been made in patch 8.2. And I have a whole lot of things to say about that, but let's start with the journey. As always, the journey has a standard track with 100 rewards and a premium track with 100 rewards. And this time we're looking at Yennefer. And the standard part this time is actually featuring Nimue. If you don't know who Nimue is, she is basically the narrator of one of the final uh, Witcher books, so The Lady of the Lake is being told through the experiences that Nimue has as an Oneromancer. So you, if you're familiar with the universe, an Oneromancer is a mage that is proficient in foretelling the, the future and the past through dreams. So we've seen that in The Witcher 3, you read about that in the books as well. And she's a young Oneromancer in the very far future in uh, the Witcher history after the events of Geralt etc and she's retelling the the, the tale of uh, yeah what basically happens at the end of the story of Ciri, Geralt and Yennefer. Um, and I think what the situation here is that the story that we're gonna get it's actually shown with these uh, uh, Thronebreaker style drawings is that Nimue is just um, telling us the story of Yennefer. So this is her birth, because you can see it's a baby with the uh, the kind of the hunchback that Yennefer was known for before. And basically that's what this entire um, journey is based upon. It's Yennefer's life story, because as you can see, the very first Yennefer we're getting is the young Yanka avatar. So the, the birth name of Yennefer was Yanka. Uh, and of course we're getting the amazing sorceress uh, skin, basically her look from the Witcher tree as your leading skin. Premium as always, you're looking at the mobile prices. Uh, I think it's about a euro uh, cheaper if you're going with uh, GOG, good old games. But might actually be two, um, but that's for the premium pass. Again, very, very good value as always. If you want to spend a lot more money, you can already get 25 levels on top of that. Again, as I said in previous journeys, that's not worth the money, at least to me. Um, but if you're looking to support CD Projekt Red on this amazing game, then you can definitely do so by doing that. But the premium pass, 10.99, uh, and I think it might actually be 8.99 if you go to GOG. So that's still the cheaper option. But since I'm playing on mobile, you could actually go through GOG and just purchase it there, and then you will have it unlocked if your account is linked uh, to your mobile version. Then you can get that cheaper over there. But uh, yeah, let's purchase that right now. And there we go, that unlocks the leader skin immediately. So we can see that in full. Um, it's just yeah, uh, uh, just adding to the trio that we already had, well, the duo that we already had. We had Geralt, we had Ciri, and now, of course, we have the primary leading female character, Yennefer, as well. So, just going through the ornaments, there's, of course, new sets of coins that look really, really nicely uh, animated. And then we're getting, actually, some really interesting ways in how the leader skin actually changes. So, like, her top part of her outfit is customizable. So, like, for, for instance, here, it's a cape. We have feathers. We have, like, a collar. There's all sorts of stuff. I'm going to go through this rather quickly and just highlight some of the best pieces in the journey right now. Because there's some gorgeous pieces of art again. One of which is the beautification card back. So, if you know the story of Yennefer, you know what this is representing. You see her hand at the bottom with the shards of glass where she tried to kill herself um, at the beginning of I think also the, the Netflix Witcher series um, where she just tries to kill herself because she doesn't feel like she's uh, worthy of living anymore but then of course you see on the left side you see her old look the uh, hunchback the uh, well the scars in her face and then of course turning into the beautiful version that we know because of her transformation into a full-blown sorceress. Really, really amazing artwork. This is, it tells the entire story just with one image. 
Then we get the alternative uh, skin from The Witcher 3, which is the feather skin. Um, really, really nice looking. Uh, I think I used this even for my playthrough originally on the YouTube channel. It is just uh, a really cool alternative cons costume. The next card back is more in the lines of what we got with uh, Geralt as well, because we had kind of that wolf version of this uh, card back as well, but now with the ravens, obviously, and again, the beautification at the top. Um, but yeah, pretty straightforward card back of that. They have that established style for some of these. And then we have the Battle Mage armor. That's actually a really cool addition. Kind of looks like what we got for Alzur as well. But it is in her style. There's like the feathers in the armor itself. And it just looks really, really nice on her. Then we got another one of the card backs, the encounter card backs, where uh, Yennefer is trying to hold off Villain Trettenmert, uh, or Board Street Jackdaws as he's known, the golden dragon from uh, the stories in the original uh, Lost Wish book, I think. Uh, and you can also see the, uh, the dwarves in the back um, trying to kill the dragon as well. But uh, as we know, that story turns out a little bit differently than just that. But it's another very, very cool visual telling a story with just a single image. And then we get the Violet Sorcerer skin. I'm, I also really like this. It's a bit more colorful than what Yennefer usually wears. So with the purple or the violet, I should say. It looks really, really nice. And then finally, for the more stylish options, we have the Ball Gown first. A very, very stylish dress. And then the final, final skin is sort of like a variation on this with the Necromancer gown. Also adding that uh, makeup, that very dark black makeup that I think also, also got in his uh, Necromancer outfit. So that's uh, starting to become a little bit of a theme. There's also a lot of auras and ornaments that we can uh, equip Yennefer with, but that's basically the main gist of it. I'm also quickly going to show you a few of the alternative skins that you can get if you complete some of the contracts, because those are back as well. So if you go to your contract and scroll all the way down, TDPR has been so nice of uh, to uh, well provide us with a separate category for the contracts that are linked to the journey, so they're more easily found here. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you can already start to see a bit of a team. So we have a few recolorings of existing um, like ornaments that are in here. But what's most important to me, well. What I really like about these alternative ones is that they all go for the white um, in the outfits uh, as an alternative skin. So we have the white, iv the ivory battle armor. We also have an ivory version of the, the feather armor, the light armor. So that kind of looks like what series default outfit is, which is something I really like. And then of course the gold and white dress. This thing, it looks just really nice. I don't think I can properly preview it from here, but it is just absolutely stunning as you can see. I can't really showcase it here, but once you unlock that, it's gonna be absolutely stunning on the battlefield. But that's it for Journey, the Yennefer's Journey. Again, really, really good value for what, you're, uh, what you need to spend if you wanna go for that premium pass. But uh, other than that, even the default uh, bot has some really, really cool avatars again. And that loading screen, I'm still not over that loading screen. That just looks absolutely badass. But something else also got released today. Well, I think by the time this video comes out, it's gonna be yesterday. But patch 8.2, we got over 60 changes to uh, specific cards. And uh, I'm not gonna go over each and every one of them, but I'm gonna just highlight a few that stood out to me as positive or negative. Well, personally, of, co of course, it's gonna be my opinion, but some of them aren't as good to me as others. So let's dive in and uh, yeah, let's check out the deck builder. So the first team that Ryan and Jean um, actually explained to us with what they were trying to do with this uh, patch was that they want to try and buff all the lock cards. Basically, why? Um, I don't get this change at all, just buffing every single lock card. So, um, so for example, if we go through the neutral cards, um, I actually need to go to six provisions now because uh, our good friend Dorgare of Vol actually got a power buff. So I think before he was five power for seven provisions with lock and now he's six power for six provisions with lock. So basically what they try to do is to match the power to the provision 
for the uh, neutral lock cards and then increase the power even higher for faction specific lock cards aside from Nilf cards. So if you look over here at Jenge Frat, also six provisions, so it has been demoted to six permission provisions, but of course that's a buff. Uh, the Bloodthirst also has been decreased, I think. Originally that was Bloodthirst 2, although I'm not entirely sure, but now it's Bloodthirst 1, lock an enemy unit, and you have one extra power. So that is extremely, extremely powerful. I think the same thing happens to uh, the Skoya Cell, yeah, over here. So Kiaren um, actually got a provision uh, buff, so went from 7 to 6. Um, still has its uh, normal deployability, still has 5 power, but of course this is a buff because the lock uh, also is accompanied with the move, and moving a unit of course is very strong in Squirtel, especially since the last expansion, and that's just, I don't know. Um, in the other factions I agree, but there's a lot of benefit to, inc well, decreasing the provision value of um, the neutral lock cards, because Nilfgaard has already been lousy with lock cards and this just yeah emphasizes that all the more. So I don't really get that buff. I think locking, especially as a Nilfgaardian archetype, was already strong enough. Uh, it didn't need that buff, but we'll see how it turns out. Um, it is, of course, uh, their decision to change that. It's not something I can do about, but uh, still, it's st it struck me as a weird change. Now, something that I did really like is that they actually buffed um, a few of the neutral mages, something that I will go into very big detail in in one of my new decks. You can see it on the side already, kind of like a spoiler for uh, upcoming Gwent Edge episodes. But uh, you can see the Spellfire Reborn deck there because um, most of the Yennefer cards actually got a buff. So Yennefer Conjurer dropped down from 10 provisions to 9 and she got Zeal, so you can use her order ability that damages all the highest enemy units without even needing initiative by one, um, just once at least, so when she is played. So that could be a something around like 10 points in one go if you play this correctly. So that is gonna be very, very nice to experiment with. Definitely something that I'm gonna use. And then the other Yennefer card, the Yennefer Vengerberg card, also got a provision uh, buff. So went from 11 to 10. So very, very nice to even just get that back into your deck, try to include that somewhere. Um, I don't know why, because especially this uh, Yennefer Vengerberg card is very powerful in swarm decks if you manage to more quickly generate units in your opponent very very powerful or just as a counter to swarm decks if you're not into swarm decks all that often um very very cool uh buff to my mind so i really really approve that but for my favorite range, I really need to go down again in the neutral cards because uh, the six provision Xavier Lemons actually got a very, very cool buff. So he went from eight provisions to six. He can't banish three cards at one go anymore, but he does now get the order ability of the same uh, type. So if you put him on the melee row, you can banish a card from your opponent's graveyard. If you put him on the ranged row, you banish a card from your graveyard. But uh, this is a stronger squirrel, so a higher power squirrel, but he also has zeal, so you can use it immediately. Squirrel can already do that, it's a deployability, but he also has a cooldown of one, so you can use this ability every turn, basically allowing you to destroy every card in your opponent's graveyard if um, this card goes unanswered. So very, very strong uh, against certain archetypes, especially card decks like Monsters or Skellige that try to work with the graveyard a lot. Uh, this card is going to be a game changer in that case, especially against something like a Lippy deck, you can clear out that entire graveyard, making Lippy just basically useless if you come up against Xavier. Um, so yeah, very looking forward to uh, trying to fit him into a few decks, because uh, he's gonna be well worth it now. And sadly, well not sadly, it's, it's a bit split down the middle. So Monsters is up next. Monsters, um, let's start with the big one, of course. Uh, Vi, um, Vi got changed, obviously. So his power dropped from 8 to 7, his provisions were increased from 12 to 14, and then his ability basically stayed the same. So he starts at a lower uh, point uh, total, so at 7 instead of 8, and of course you need two more provisions to fit him into the deck. Um, this is going to be a sufficient nerf, but I feel like it's going to be... It's a weird way of nerfing it, because... Since the ability doesn't change, they, CDPR felt obliged 
to change uh, something else, something I don't really agree with. So if you go to the uh, abilities here, they also nerfed Overwhelming Hunger. They didn't really explain this as a nerf, but it is definitely a nerf. Um, it's actually still displaying wrong here um, because Overwhelming Hunger has been changed from 14 provision bonus to 15 provision bonus, so that's a boost. Um, but the charges on Overwhelming Hunger has been decreased from 3 to 2. It doesn't really show correctly here, I don't know why, because I have the updated version here, but it has been decreased to only 2 charges, so you only get 2 free consumes. The Akimaras have been boosted by uh, from 2 to 3, so they explained it as, okay, you're still getting 6 points from the leading ability on top of the destroys, but that was never what the value of Overwhelming Hunger was about. You got three uh, quick fire abilities from that. Um, and I feel like that's a, a mistake because uh, there are other abilities that do the same thing that weren't changed like this. Um, like for example, if you go with, with shield wall, you get three charges of getting a shield, which could boost a ability to go way farther than it should. For example, the dueling ability, that's what it's usually used for. Um, so yeah, I don't see why. Scoitel got, of course, Precision Strike still. Um, so you could still do that. Syndicate's got the two um, multiple abilities with multiple charges. That also could trigger or ease the uh, triggering of abilities. So I think it's a mistake. The reason why they're doing this, according to CDPR, is that they could buff uh, Death Wish abilities a bit more. I agree with that. They, it, it sounds really cool that they're gonna buff Death Wish abilities, but the problem is that they changed Overwhelming Hunger and didn't buff Death Wish abilities. They did for some of the very low provision cards, if you go all the way to the bottom and check out stuff like um, there was a lot of provision uh, boosts to like um, the five provision Death Wish units. So I think the biggest one here is the Bridge Troll that has been moved from five to four provisions. That's one of the examples. Um, but it's only limited to the very low provision bronze cards, um, which is cool. Of course, we now have a eight point potential card at four provisions, but the other, the golden abilities didn't really increase in power all that much, which is, I feel like it's, it's, they tried to segment the change and they didn't really manage to do that properly because now overwhelming hunger is underpowered at least a little bit. And there was nothing that we got in return for that. So I guess we'll have to see. I'm going to try that out if that changes anything. But I'm pretty sure that the extra consume will actually change quite a bit. Especially on cards like that love and stuff like that. You can't really boost that power in one go anymore. And that gives your opponent uh, the ability to lock that. So I feel like it's it's not a good way. Because Death Wish has always been a uh, lower archetype. It hasn't been, really been that strong. Aside from, of course, the Videx. That were then introduced but other than that it's not really yeah it's it's not really something that needed this this nerf basically for its most important leader ability now aside from that that we did get a bronze card change that i really really like so the fuka now has uh no armor but it has thrive too so his ability was changed the original ability was that the thrive uh was also triggered by your opponent's units that well since he starts at 4, that wasn't really that valuable, I think. You could, if you play against another monster deck, get a lot of high-powered units from your opponent, but that was only one use case. Now with Thrive 2, you have control over that ability in one go. And this can go really, really quickly. Uh, I think even with Oberon, if you pull uh, the Anal Conqueror, you get Foka to 8 power in one go. Uh, and then, of course, you can uh, put Woodland Spirit on top of that and you get a 10 power Foka in the same turn. So Thrive could really, really benefit from this change. Uh, I guess we'll have to see in practice if it actually does. But Foka is, to my mind, a really, really good change. And that, that's it basically for monsters. Uh, there was not that many changes aside from, of course, the most obvious one that we just talked about. So let's head to Skellige now. Because Skellige did get some changes. Uh, the most um, weird one to me was the change to Lippy. I feel like they're not understanding what Lippy is about. Lippy got a provision nerf and a power nerf. Which is fine, I guess. But that's not going to change the power of the deck, because the power of the deck was in that card. 
in Ceres mostly, and of course in the uh, the boosts that uh, Roach and Nickers got in one of the previous patches. Uh, so not really much to say about that. What I did find a lot more interesting was the fact that self wound archetypes got a, a lot of changes. So. Uh, for example, we got Olaf is now starting at 10 power. That is huge. So that means that he could technically go to uh, 19 if you manage to play the Heim on top of that. So that is amazing. And talking about the Heim, the Heim actually got a huge provision uh, buff as well because he went from, was he 9? I think it was, yeah, it might have been eight. So from eight to seven. So that's another provision buff on top of that. So the classic Heim and Olaf combo is back basically, um, which gives you just a lot of, a lot of options to play with. Uh, on the other side, I think uh, the giant boar was changed slightly that you, yeah, boost out by the amount the unit is damaged. So that could also be applied to your own units. So basically, if you got uh, Olaf all the way down to the bottom, you could then play the giant boar, although that doesn't really feel like it's going to do good because um, you need two cards in two turns. So that's not going to be a good play. But there might be use cases for giant boar here uh, now that he also works on your own units. But the most interesting nerf in uh, Skellig is actually to its location card. So... The location card is nerfed since the order ability has been changed from healing uh, three uh, points from your adjacent units to healing two points from your adjacent units, which makes a lot of sense because Han Kadug was a very easy 14 point play. Let's be honest, that was just a very easy 14 point play. Now you get a 12 point play. And as Ryan actually pointed out really, really nicely in their, um, their stream, that causes you to, if you use the Bear Witches at each side of it, that causes you to remain with two wounded units. So that is very, very interesting indeed. Um, so we'll see if that actually works to the self wound archetype. I think it should, because it's uh, it's very, very nice. Um, and that's it for Skellige, basically, because not much else has changed. Skellige was already very powerful, um, so they didn't feel the need to change much else. So basically focusing on the self wound archetype. Then... Um, not much has changed to Northern Realms, basically nothing. Um, but one thing that I want to note is that I've been playing around with the uh, classic Griffin Witcher deck. That is extremely powerful. It feel, sometimes feels like you're playing this game on easy mode and they haven't changed anything to that archetype, which strikes me as baffling because the amount of points you're getting out of that is just insane we talked about that in my um uh, way of the witcher expansion uh, video on northern realm specifically that i felt like the cards were uh, the new witches that they introduced were a bit weird their abilities didn't really gel all that well with what the faction stands for and while playing it that actually makes starts to make sense because the amount of points you're getting just because of the archetype is so immense that it really doesn't matter what the abilities on the cards are. Um, that's why they don't make sense, I think, because, yeah, you got a lot of hand boosting, um, and that's cool, but that's not what Northern Realms is about. And right now it's the strongest archetype in the faction, which doesn't make any sense. The, the way I would change this is there's one card that breaks all of this, and it's this guy. Because Vesemir Mentor got the very insane buff that he not only boosts the witches in your hand and deck at adrenaline 5 but he boosts all your witches on the board by one as well so basically he has the same ability as erland in if you're playing a witcher deck because all the cards in your deck will be witches aside from maybe a few lay incitement um for two provisions less just keep that in mind for two provisions less yes it has an adrenaline requirement but Nevertheless, his deployability is basically a bone talisman. So you get four points, a bone talisman, and boosting everything on your hand and deck by one. That is insane. This card is really broken in that archetype. I'm just putting that out there, especially if you compare it to... Um, where the hell are my filters? Um, to, to Erland here. He does the same thing. Yes, he has the order ability, so you can get all the boosts, but nobody uses it for that, or rarely. But he costs two provisions more. That is, that, that really doesn't make sense to me. Um, 
But yeah, that's the way it is. It's a really cool archetype. I gotta give it to that, but it's just way too easy to win with this. So yeah, to recapitulate, absolutely fine with Erland. Not that fine with um, Vesemir in this current state. But again, very cool deck, uh, but it, it feels like it's just a bit too overtuned at the moment. Something that, that uh, CDPR also confirmed in their developer stream, but they're still looking out uh, to see how they're gonna change. I think they're, they're just not sure how they would change this. Um, cause Vesemir is a really good card. I, I would just bump him up by two provisions right now, uh, unless they find a way to changing his, uh, his abilities. But right now it feels like the neutral card is cheaper and better than Erland, which is supposed to be the best, uh, faction cards of that expansion. Um, so yeah, I well, guess we'll see it, um, if that changes anything. On to, on to another faction. Um, we're actually going to Scoia'tael this time. Scoia'tael actually had a very good run this uh, past two months because of the movement abilities. Um, they barely changed anything about that, which is fine, I guess. There's a bit too many engines in this in this faction now, to my mind, since again, Squirtel was never really the the uh, the engine faction, uh, or not in this sense at least, with the uh, the, the aggressive engines and the cat witches. But uh, one thing that was really cool is that Nova Gradient Justice was changed, in that you now already need to control a dwarf for it to uh, have its full effect, um, which means that you can't just shove it into any deck as most players were doing uh, because it was just 10 provisions gave you tinning and gave you uh what was it 13 points with the uh the muscles uh no the yeah the volunteers so yeah a uh, very good change um, i'm glad that was introduced because that was just a lazy include in every square tell deck that you saw uh, so going to be good for the variety in Squiretel. Maybe you can check even my Harmony deck out, because that actually got a buff. So, because uh, we got a buff to the leader ability that had a provision buff and a power buff for Dana, which is uh, very, very good indeed. So check out that Harmony deck, because it's going to break some uh, break some legs in this, uh, in this uh, month, in this season. And then the other change that was uh, really significant is, well, not that significant, they reduced the adrenaline cost for for uh, the Cat Witcher from four to three. So you have one turn less of that two damaging. I still feel like it's way too overtuned the Cat Witcher or it needs to get a provision nerf as well because you're guaranteed to get at least um, six points out of this and then way more because of the movement. Because it's a card that moves on its own and damages on its own. It's just too much. Um, but again, we'll, we'll see, um, cause it basically has the same provisions as a Dryad Matron, which moves and boosts, but usually when they're balancing Gwent, they tend to give more, uh, focus on, uh, well, damaging is usually more costly than boosting bit provision wise. So it makes more sense that this would be six provisions, um, especially because it increases to two damage after that, after the adrenaline cost. So. That is still 8 damage if you play that at the correct adrenaline time. And that is huge. That is just 12 points without factoring in the fact that it constantly moves and gets boosts from that as well. So still think this is a problematic card, but at least it's nerfed a little bit. Um, that's it for Squiretel. And then the best faction that has been changed. So people who follow my channel a bit know that I'm a bit of a fan of Syndicate, just the way it works, that it's a completely different faction. But sadly, it wasn't really that played... Uh, well, that highly played in the last months. Even though my Syndicate video on the Taste Like Poison deck, which is still very, very good, by the way, especially with the changes right here, is was one of, was the most watched video this month. So I uh, thanks again for your support, by the way. But there have been a few changes, uh, especially just focusing on those new cards. So that deck just increased in power, basically. Uh, Rayla got an Adrenaline Boost. So instead of waiting for Adrenaline 3, I think it was originally, now you only have to wait until Adrenaline 5, so you can play this very, very early, so you can gain the benefit from all those tribute abilities. Uh, very, very powerful card now, right now. It already was, but right now that is just amazingly strong. Then Louisa, Madame Louisa, got probably the strongest buff in the patch, um, because if you pay three coins or two coins with of the books, you actually give her zeal, which means that your tribute, your next tribute will automatically be free. So 
if you count that, you can actually get Savola all for free. Because Savola also gives you back those two coins. So if you play, if you have the two coins, play Madame Luisa, pay the tribute, you can immediately trigger her and then play Savola for free. And you get the two coins back since Savola has a two point profit. Two coin profit. So Madame Luisa has three points. Just if you have large tribute abilities, why not use her? Aside, of course, from the fact that you won't trigger Rayla with that tribute then, but you paid for Madame Luisa with the tribute, just a little bit, so you got the points going over there, and then your tribute was free regardless. Um, it is kind of a trade-off, because I know Fallen Rayla gets the benefit from you actually paying the tribute, so that doubles up the coins. So if you're not spending those coins, you're also not gaining double the benefit from the coins, and possibly only half the benefit. It's a weird bit of math, but that's basically what this change causes, if you want to include Madame Luisa in a tribute deck, of course, but why wouldn't you? Again, she's three points. So, we talked about the fact that they buffed all the lock cards, and they technically also did with Kurt, but aside from the fact that he doesn't lock cards anymore. So right now, they changed his lock ability with a bounty ability, which of course fits the archetype better, but that also means that Syndicate doesn't have a lock card anymore. Which is fine, I guess. He's also gone to 6 for 6 uh, with a bounty. So, yeah, Kurt is just a really good card now. Um, which I think would make my Passive Floria bounty deck from what Blink 2 months ago even more viable now. Because that would be a 6 power bounty unit. An extra bounty unit, basically. So that's going to be very, very strong indeed. And then... Basically, the, the front runner of this patch was the Salamandra Mage, which have has gotten a, a really big buff. So I think the tribute ability stayed the same, but uh, his passive ability will now always trigger. So even on his own tribute ability. So you gain an extra coin for every tribute you, ability you pay, which of course gels very well with Fallen Rayla. But if you play Salamandra Mage with off the books, you get uh, you pay three coins. But you get 6 damage for that, so basically giving you, if you count the coins for points, you get, uh, you spend 8 points, 5 provisions, 3 coins, if you're following along, and then you get 5 power, 6 damage, and 1 coin. So that's 12 points for 8 value spent. If you're adrenaline 5, you're actually getting 13 points. And then afterwards, of course, you're getting those extra coins every time you pay a tribute ability. So... Very, very powerful card. Um, I've actually doubled up on the Salamander Mage now. I can actually show you that a little bit. If I go back to my Taste Like Poison deck from a while back, I actually uh, adjusted it slightly. Um, as you can see, I didn't include Madame Luisa for the explanation I just give, gave before, because I feel like there's enough ways to get coins that we won't need Madame Luisa in this. Um, and then, of course, I doubled up on the Salamander Mage because he's, he's really powerful now. I'm going to be spending, um, I think, my first uh, rank up on this deck. And I'm pretty sure I'll rank up rather quickly from uh, 3 to 2. Uh, from 4 to 3, because I never got to pro last uh, time. Because I was experimenting. But this should be a good deck to do that. And then we'll see after that. Because uh, there's a lot of things I want to experiment with. Because that was basically all the changes. Um, there's some really, really good changes in there. A, a few questionable ones, but overall... It's going to be a very, very good patch. With that said, I'm actually really curious to hear your opinion. Um, tell me what you think of the balance changes, which were your favorite changes, which uh, changes you didn't really agree with, because that's the point where we can start arguing about stuff like this. Um, also, let, tell me what you think about the new journey, because that's, to my mind, one of the best ones we, we've gotten so far. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit... I mean... I just like Jennifer, I hashtag Team Yen. Uh, I'm always going to be very excited if she enters the game. So uh, let me know what you think of that. And let me know what you think of this video. Give it a like if you liked it. Don't give it a like if you didn't like it, I suppose. But I'm really curious about your feedback. It's always very welcome. Thank you enormously for watching, especially if you made it this far with me rambling on about this very, very gorgeous card game. But uh, thank you again enormously for watching. And I hope to see you in the next episode of Gwentech, where we'll talk about another deck guide. So thank you enormously for watching and see you in the next episode of Gwentech. Goodbye. Stay nutty.